This morning, we are going to talk about four ways that people are drawn to Jesus. Have you ever heard the phrase, magnetic power? Have you ever heard that phrase? That person has a, a magnetic personality. You ever met anybody with a magnetic personality? The idea is that person can draw, you're just drawn to that person for some reason. A magnetic personality. And the idea of that being a, the magnet, the magnetic drawing power, people uh, that people draw, that certain people draw people to them, follows the principle of the magnet, which has that drawing power. When I was a child, we used to play with magnets all the time. I don't know if girls ever play with magnets. I wasn't paying attention to girls at that time. Magnets were more interesting to me than girls. Okay? But we would take these magnets and we would go along and try to find metal. And you don't know what I'm talking about. And try, and we were just amazed by it. The magnetic power of that. And we'd just play with them all day long. Uh, I was just thinking, we used to play with... Uh, uh, those, what do you call those, magnifying glasses too, and start fires. But that's for another sermon, okay? <laughs> I just thought of a few fires I started back when I was a kid that I probably should have done. But anyway, this lesson isn't about magnifying glasses, it's about magnetic power, okay? Did you know that God has always or has ways of drawing people to Him and His Son? Just as metal things are drawn by the power of the magnet. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6 that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And that is the absolute truth. No one can come to God except through Jesus Christ. There is only one way to be with God, and that is through Jesus. But God's word reveals to us several ways that people can be drawn to Jesus so that we can have an opportunity to reach the Father. Several ways to be drawn to Jesus. And this morning we're going to talk about that. This morning as we are thinking about our theme for the year, Evangelize Just One in 2021. Let's realize that people are drawn to Jesus in several ways. Number one, people are drawn to Jesus by his sacrifice on the cross. And we just, we just celebrated or remembered that sacrifice on the cross. And let's look back at the scripture that Jake read and zero in on chapter 12, verse 33, 32 and 33. Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. And then verse 33 says, he said this, signifying by what death he would die. And what Jesus has in mind there is crucifixion. And he is going to be lifted up on the cross. And that sacrifice has a drawing power to it. We just sang the song, there is power in the blood. Of Jesus that was shed for us at Calvary. And we sing that song, Power in the Blood, refers to this verse that we're singing. Power in the blood. When Jesus was raised up, it would draw people to him. And he says, all peoples to him. It was necessary that Jesus die on the cross and shed his blood in order that man might be drawn to God. You know, back in the Old Testament, they, they offered animal sacrifices of bulls and goats. But that, that blood didn't have any drawing power to it. They offered it year after year after year. But what was necessary was the blood of the Son of God, the perfect sacrifice for that to happen. It took to get death of God's Son to put this drawing power into effect. Christ's death draws us in two ways. First, it opens the door to God. It 
opens the door to God. In answering Nicodemus' question on how to be born again, Jesus responds in John 3, verses 14 and 16 through 16. And he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if you remember back then, the people that sinned, and God had sent serpent, or sent a curse, and it was killing the people. And, and Moses had to lift a serpent up on a rod. And as people looked at that serpent, they were, they, uh, when the snakes bit them, it, it would not kill them. The, the plague would not uh, kill them. And so they had to keep their eyes on what Moses was lifting up. And that's what he has reference to here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and people lived, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And what Jesus is telling Nicodemus there is you need to look to me for salvation. It is through my blood that is going to be shed for you that you are going to be saved and the second death will not have power. And this is the very door, the door to God that opened up through Jesus. In John chapter 10 and verse 9, later in John, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. We need to look to Jesus. Here we're bit, being bitten and torn apart by sin in this world. And the only way we're going to survive this earth and go to heaven is by looking to Jesus and walking through Jesus and going through Jesus. Again, remember what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, the first way that the death of Jesus draws us is that it's the open door to God. Secondly, Christ's death appeals to people with honest hearts who are touched with such a sacrifice. There are people in this world who are hard-hearted, who can read this account in the, in the book of John throughout the New Testament, who can read that and not be touched by it. There are hard people like that. That Jesus suffered on the cross. And for some reason they're not touched by that. They're, but people with honest hearts are touched. When they read a passage like Romans chapter 5 verses 8 through 10. God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Much more than now having been justified by his blood that he shed when he was lifted up. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God and made friends with God again. Through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. How can a person not be touched with that? I'll tell you how they cannot be touched with that. It just dawned on me. And I've known this. And you know it too. They don't think they've sinned. They don't think they've done anything wrong. They think they are good people. And many of them are good. They do great, wonderful works. They do many things. They may pray. They may give. They may do all these things. But as Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. They're not touched by it because they don't think they need Jesus. They don't think they've sinned that much. I'm a good person. He'll understand. We talked about this last week. But Jesus said, you need to do the will of my Father in heaven. And so when a person realizes their sinful state, that they're in deep trouble, they may get through this life unscathed, you know, pretty much unscathed. They're not going to get through the next life unscathed because they didn't prepare themselves. They didn't respond 
when the preacher or the class teacher or the person on the radio or TV read this passage, that God demonstrated his own love for us, for me, that while I am yet a sinner, while I was in sin, Christ died for me so that I could be saved. How could people not be touched with that? The people with honest and good hearts are. Knowing that Christ died for us should draw us to God through our obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said it well in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. He said, for the love of Christ compels us. It compels us. We can't just sit here and do nothing. We know we need to do something. We need to respond to the great love God has for us. So we constantly feel that, you know, if we're outside of Christ, and you've been outside of Christ just like I have, maybe some of us still are, and we hear a message like this, and it draws us, and we feel uncomfortable, you know. When I sin, and I need to ask forgiveness, the love of Christ compels me. I can't just sit there in that sin and try to forget it. The love of Christ compels me to do something about it. I need to respond. That's that drawing power of God. He's drawing us to him. Please come. That's how he draws us. One way. Another way, people are drawn to Jesus by good works. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So good works, letting them shine, draws people to them. Have you ever been in a real dark place and turned on with a lot of bugs <laughs> and turned on a light? Do you know what happens? I'm thinking of camp is what I'm thinking of. When you turn on that light, those bugs see that light and they fly right at it. You know, they got, they're drawn by it. And people are that way too. If we're out in the middle of the darkness wandering around and we see a light turned on, there's a light. And we start walking to that light. We're drawn to it. And good works are like that. Good deeds touch the hearts of the needy and others who see good works done by those who love the Lord. They see those good works and they say, man, that was wonderful. And they start asking questions. Good deeds soften people's hearts. That was nice. Their hearts are just often. Good deeds arouse interest. wonder why you did that. And they start asking questions. The world must see our good works by our good works that we do, that we care for them. And we have many ministries in place to show that. It is God's will that we be involved in good works. He wants us to constantly be involved in good works. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, who are of the church. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Don't move. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. Woo! Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The text says that we are to have special concern toward other Christians. Galatians 6 10. But it also says we are to be concerned about those who are outside the body of Christ as well, who are not Christians. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15 58, teaches us to always abound in these kinds of works. Why? Why abound in these kinds of works? Because they draw people closer to Christ. They draw people closer to God. And that's what we're all about, is trying to bring people to Christ for salvation. Good works are in keeping with God's goodness and the goodness of other Christians. When we are engaged in good works that God authorizes us to do, it is actually God working through us to accomplish His will. And He enables us to work. And in doing good works in the name of God, we are glorifying God in Christ and lifting him up for others to see. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all peoples to me. And that's our part of it. 
doing good works. <laughs> Number three, one of the ways that God draws people to, to himself is uh, by living a good life. And this is similar to good works. An example of this, though, is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Peter here uses a wife who is a member of the body of Christ, who is a believer, but whose husband is not a member of the body of Christ. He's lost. And listen to what Peter says about that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, wives, likewise, be submissive to your husbands. That's another whole sermon. That even if some do not obey the word, which is the case he's talking about here, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And that fear is not, oh, don't hit me. Not, not that kind of fear, but fear or reverence for God. Living a godly life in front of their husband who is not a believer. He says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. He doesn't say women aren't to take care of themselves and try to look pretty and all of that. He's not saying that at all. But what he's saying is, don't let it be merely outward. Don't, don't spend all your time on the outward part and nothing on the inward part. And then he goes on to say, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. You know what he's saying there? He's saying that people in general, he uses a wife here, but it works the other side too. If the wife is a non-believer and the husband is, it works the same way. If you work on the inward beauty of a godly person inside, that spouse, that other person, may be one to Christ, without even saying a word. They may look at you and be so moved by your behavior that they want to be like you and obey the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? By one's faithfulness to the Lord, others may be converted to Jesus. Our manner of life teaches more than, uh, many times, our manner of life teaches more than our words do. We had this happen this week, over the last couple of weeks. And Don shared a story, an account that's happening with him right now. And I don't embarrass you, Don. But Don goes out and walks every morning. He walks. And there's a guy in his neighborhood that's, that delivers the paper. And he sees Don every morning. And they say hi and so forth. And somehow, this guy, recognized in Don a godly man. And he stops Don on the street recently and he tells him, he says, basically, I perceive that you are a very spiritual, uh, godly man and I'd like to talk to you. And they struck up a conversation and they have a conversation going now. And I'm telling you what, I firmly believe this. This is not Don. This is God working in Don's life to draw people to him. And you know what? God is working that way in your life too. If you're live, trying to live the best you can, a godly life. People are going to respond to you. People are going to be attracted to you. And many of you know that. When their life falls apart, when they need prayer, they don't go to a guy across the street who parties late on Saturday night, you know, and, and does other worldly things. They're going to search you out. And they're going to ask you to pray for them. God is working in your life by the conduct of your life. And people will be drawn to God through you. And that's what Peter's talking about right here. Even though people in the world today have Bibles, Everyone, almost everyone has a Bible. People are giving them away free. Everybody has a Bible. Uh, few people read the Bible on a regular basis. And as a result, the good life of a Christian is the only Bible many people will ever read. It's the only one they'll ever read. And that may in turn cause them 
because they see in us godly people, godly examples, it may interest them so much that someday they will actually take their Bible and start reading it and find out more that's contained in the pages of God's Word. There is a great poem that I would like to share with you that expresses how important it is for us to live a life in Christ that will draw people to Him. And it's entitled, The World's Bible. It's by Annie Johnson Flint. And I believe there's a song uh, that has been created to go with these words. Christ has no hands but our hands to do His work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in His way. He has no tongues but our tongues to tell men how He died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. We are the only Bible the careless world will ever read or will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message given in deed and word. What if that type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy with work other than His? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurements is? What if our tongues are speaking of things His lips would spurn? How can we hope to help Him and welcome His return? We have a very important part in drawing people to God. By living a good life of the Lord, people can be influenced to want to live a good life as well and be drawn to Jesus. Paul so lived this kind of life and the world could see Christ living in him. And that was his purpose. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That right there is the perfect scripture for total dedication to the Lord. And I don't know about you, but every time I read it, I realize how much I fall short. Every single time. And that I have work to do in this area myself. I don't know if you feel that way, but I do. If Paul lied, if he gossiped, if he lacked love for others, or was involved in any number of sins, the world would not have seen Christ living in him. Such conduct would have driven people away from God and caused lost souls to remain lost. I want to go back for just a moment to that magnet and another principle of magnetism. A regular magnet has two powers drawing power and a repelling power. The magnet has a positive side and a negative side. Many of us, especially males who love playing with magnets when we were younger, have tried to push those poles, light poles, together. Remember doing that? You cannot do it. You may try with all your might and there's one little sliver in there that says, no, nope, not this time, not this time. You're not going to do it. It's impossible to get them to stick. Many times, if we're not careful, we can buy, be like the negative side of the magnet, pushing people away from the Lord. Could you be pushing people away from the Lord by your conduct? What a tragedy to live a life in such a way as to repel people rather than draw them to God. That's not God wants not what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to live a life like that. What if everyone acted just like you or just like me if we lived a life that way? And we were actually repelling people. I have to be very careful sometimes. And luckily Mary and others, they will come to me sometimes and say, you sounded mean in that lesson. And I'm sure I do sometimes. I am passionate. But I need to really think about it. Am I pushing people away? By my tone of voice here from the pulpit? I know I have 
before. And I ask God to forgive me and others to forgive me for sounding like that. But I need to be aware of that all the time. Am I pushing people or am I drawing people? What kind of influence do I have? In word, how I say my words, and in deeds, what am I doing? Am I drawing people or is my conduct pushing people away? And lastly, people are drawn to Jesus by the word. The word of God. In John chapter 6, verse 44 through 45, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. We can't come to the Father without hearing the word of God. We cannot do that. Though people may be drawn to God by Christ's death, by his good works, our good works, by living a good life, it is the message of the gospel that already has caused some to do good works and to engage in good living. Because you know why? The real power of God in drawing people to salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is where the power is. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and also for the Gentile or the Greek. You realize that in hearing God's word, in obeying the word of God, the gospel, people are moving toward God. There may be some in this audience right now that are moving toward God, that aren't quite yet there for salvation, but they're moving that way. And in hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, they have the opportunity to then believe in Jesus as a son of God and begin to move in the direction of Jesus for salvation. When I study with people, I always ask them this. Can you believe in anything that you've never heard about? That's a mind bender. Spend the rest of the afternoon thinking about that right there. Can you believe in anything that you've never heard about? I'll tell you right now, the answer is no. You can't. People can't believe in Jesus as the Son of God, sacrifice himself for them to save them from sin, unless they hear. And it's God's word they have to hear, because that's where they're going to hear about Jesus. But once they hear, they have the opportunity to believe. And then in believing that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, 24, John 1, and verse 12, they then have the power or authority to become a child of God. That's what it says in John 1, 12. To become, moving even closer in the direction of salvation in Christ. Belief doesn't make you a child of God. The verse specifically says there, gives you the right power, authority to become a child of God. But you're moving in the right direction. Now you believe. And once you believe, you read a little bit further, you're going to repent. And in repenting of their sin, a person is drawing even closer to Jesus for salvation. But they're still not there yet. They're repenting. They, they have the attitude of heart that they're going to stop living according to their desires and follow after Jesus and his will. That's what repentance is. It simply means changing. And then you read a little more and you find out, I need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in confessing that he is the Son of God, you draw even closer to Jesus. Almost there for salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're drawing closer. Romans 10, 9 and 10, and Matthew 10, 32 and 33 tell us that. And then with all these things, the next thing is to be baptized into Christ. Being baptized into Christ, one fully reaches and finally reaches the blood of Jesus that, and, and is forgiven of their past sins. 
And they obtain the salvation which is in Christ. Galatians 3.27 says we're buried in Christ. Into Christ. We're buried. Romans 6. 3-5 through five says the same thing. Acts 2.38. When the people responded, they realized they just crucified the Son of God. What do we do now? We killed him. He said, repent and be baptized and receive remission of sins. Acts 22, 16. Our sins are washed away in baptism. And in Christ is where salvation is found. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. So now we have finally reached salvation in Christ Jesus by being baptized into Christ. All our sins, past sins, whatever they may be. There's no sin too great. For the blood of Jesus to wash. Amen. Could be murder. Could be adultery. Could be cannibalism. Could be sexual immorality. Anything. If you're truly repentant. God knows your heart. You're baptized into Christ. He washes away those sins. You might suffer the consequences of those sins. We've had brethren who've murdered people. Went to jail. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That sin is forgiven. But they still pay the consequences. They're still in jail. But that sin that they committed. That landed them in jail. God doesn't remember it anymore. Oh. Being baptized into Christ. Washes away our sins. But we're still not. We're, we're with Jesus. We're in Christ. But we're not in heaven with God yet. Are we? In living a life faithful to Jesus, Revelation 2.10, John 14.6, one follows Jesus, staying faithful to Jesus, we follow Jesus who is the truth, the way, and the life, and through him, we follow him right to the Father. John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we learn all of this through the pages of the New Testament when we are obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, there are four ways the scriptures tell us where God draws people to him through Jesus. By Christ's death on the cross when he's raised up, shed his blood for us. By the good works that we are privileged to do all to the glory of God, we draw people to Christ. By living a good life, Again, all to the glory of God that draws people to Christ and God because of God working in us and by the powerful word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in closing, are you living a magnetic life for the Lord? Are you living that magnetic life? Are you drawing people to Jesus because of the way you live your life? This morning, if you are in Christ and you haven't been living the magnetic life that Jesus wants you to, you need to change your ways. You need to pray to God. I'm sure you would understand, especially after giving this word to us and hearing this lesson himself. He's here, a magnetic life. Pray for a magnetic life. He'll know what you mean. He'll know you want to draw people and he will use you to do that. He's always done that. Pray for a magnetic life. Repent of your sins. Live the good life. And draw people to Christ and to God through the way you live. And it always has to begin with the gospel of salvation. Learn the word of God. Be conversant in the gospel so that you can talk to others. And the way you learn more is to study more. To come to Bible classes. To learn more. To study more. To help people. To be that magnetic person the Lord has created you to be. Now I realize some of you here are probably thinking, man, I'm pretty dull. <laughs> you can be dull and still be magnetic. Are you drawing people to Jesus because of the way you live your life? As a Christian. If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. Why not surrender your life to the Lord this morning? Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Follow his will that I've revealed to you today. 
Be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Start living a life dedicated to the Lord with real purpose in this life. There's a lot of things we can do in this life that we may think are purposeful. And they may be purposeful for this life and all good things in this life. But there's only one thing that's purposeful for the next life. And that is being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ and living a life dedicated to Him. That is profitable for godliness that will follow us into heaven. Amen. You can take it with you. You can take all the blessings of a godly life right into heaven. Make yourself rich this morning by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, being baptized into Christ. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation today, please do so right now while we stand and sing the song of invitation.